regular Drews. Hello. Welcome to episode 12. We're so glad to have you. We're going to be discussing another Nancy Drew Files, case number eight. Two points to murder. Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? We sure hope so. And we hope you are too. Join us as we talk Nancy Drew cover to cover and click to click. Welcome to regular Nancy Drew. This one was published in 1987. What a beautiful year. (laughs) I really, I wish we knew who ghost wrote these things. Yeah. Because honestly, I I cannot describe to you how, like, it's just pure gold. It's pure gold. It's pure 1980s gold. But we'll get into it. Do you want to talk about the cover? Yeah. We got two different covers here. Let's see. (gasps) This is an English printing. This is from Great Britain. That's why it looks oh, like this. No wonder. Yeah. I was like, because it does, it looks different than all of the rest of the Nancy Drew files that I have. Um, mine features what looks like, uh, it's kind of a vision Um, So we've got people in the middle of what looks to be a basketball game. Number 33 is like mid dunk into the net. But there is also, from a scene in the book, there is also a dummy being hung from the basketball hoop. And um, Nancy features in the front kind of looking over her shoulder really, honestly, kind of sexily. And I don't know how I feel about it. (laughs) She has quite the hairdo, too. She's got, like, the 1980s, like, feathered top look with kind of like the stringy strands down at the end. But she does have a great, pretty great jacket on, I gotta say. It's leather looking with kind of like a soft lining look. But that's that's what my cover looks like. <laughs> looks like mine is a first printing from 1987. So that would wow. make sense. I love your cover. Your cover looks dope. The colors are, yes. colors are awesome. Uh, so on mine, it's the same scene with the dummy hanging from the basketball hoop, but uh, Nancy is standing in the foreground wearing a complete uh, sweatshirt outfit, green, <laughs> like an emerald green sweatshirt with a matching skirt made out of Aww. the same material. It looks like sweatshirt <laughs> material. I don't even know what to call that. And then I guess the coach just standing behind her there, kind of looking suspiciously at her. I don't think that's Ned. I yeah, assumed it was the coach, but I don't know who else it would be. Well, honestly, it might be Ned because of the dark hair. Oh, yeah. He just looks older, though. I hope it's yeah, not. Yeah, I know. I hope, hope not. I, hope. <laughs> I gotta say, though, that outfit is, like, uh, peak 80s fashion. Yeah, oh, I don't yeah. know what you call that either, but, like, sweatshirt, sweat, skirt combo. Mm-hmm. I love it. Bring back the sweat skirt. <laughs> sweat skirt. <laughs> She's also wearing a black pearl necklace with a matching pearl ring. What? That's kind of cool. Yeah, I don't mean like just like a ring with a pearl on it. It's like a, a string of pearls wrapped around her finger. Wow. Wow, the accessorizing. Yeah, and a little watch, which is also very 80s. This so. is wearing a watch on my cover too. Um, but it looks very thick and silver. It almost looks like, if you ask me, a men's watch. Mm. Um, you can't see a whole lot of it. But if I were to guess... I would think it might be uh, Mr. Nickerson's silver watch. Oh, you know, actually, it might be the silver bracelet he gives her. Probably. Mine's, she's not wearing one on mine, so. Bummer. Yeah, it's probably totally the silver bracelet he's supposed to give her. That makes sense. Anyway. So according to the back of this, this book was originally cost two pounds in England and $5.95 in Australia and $7.50 in New Zealand. Nice. So for those of you, I guess, I guess we should just tell you this is, this book is intense when it comes to the Ned and Nancy relationship. Mm -hmm. I really, really recommend that you read it. If you can get a copy of it, if you can get your hands on it, um, because it is crazy. Mm -hmm. So do you want to just go ahead and 
Joe, Let's so do three words first. Oh, right, 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 right. Three words. So, oh, basketball. Obviously. Basketball, yes. Basketball. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean. Sabotage? Yeah, it's okay, yeah. Sabotage, basketball, sabotage, and drama. Drama, yeah. Drama. Drama llama. More drama than you could want in a Nancy Drew mystery. Jam-packed with drama. I love it. <laughs> okay. So, Let's get into it. Yeah. So we join our super sleuth, Nancy, Bess, and George, um, as they're driving to Emerson College um, because they've been invited by Coach Burnett, the coach of the Wildcats basketball team that Ned is co-captain of, to help investigate something going on with the basketball team. We aren't really given a lot of details as to what that is right up front, um, but that's all what Nancy says. Um, Ned had told his coach about Nancy and her kind of prowess with detectiving. Detecting? Detecting. Mm-hmm. Um, and... So that's why she's coming. But we also learn um, during this drive, Nancy kind of, her mind kind of wanders because she's a little concerned about her and her relationship with Ned right now. Mm. Apparently, it's been a little bit cool. Um, He hasn't been as talkative on the phone. And she's kind of worried that they've drifted apart. So, yeah. We also learned that the Wildcats basketball team has a chance of making the playoffs, but if all this sabotage keeps happening, it could mean that they don't get to go. Can we also talk about really quick how they're the Wildcats? And I know that, you know, High School Musical occurred much, much into the future from these books, 20-something years ahead of these books. But all I wanted to do every time I saw Wildcats was just go, Wildcats, (laughs) your hands up in the air. So if you all have... Any uh, high school musical gifs, please send them to us so that we can um, appreciate those. (laughs) Anyway, they get to Emerson College and they go straight into the athletic complex in the gym to find Ned and talk to the coach. But Ned doesn't have a hug hello for Nancy. No hug, no kiss. He just kind of waves. Kind of keeps her at arm's length. It's very strange. Very strange. But so we... um, we meet Mike, Ned's co-captain, and apparently best friend um, on the team. And then we talk to Coach Burnett and the team doctor, Dr. Riggs, about a practical joker, apparently, who has been playing some weird pranks on this basketball team, sometimes during the game. Recently, a smoke bomb was set off in the locker room at halftime in one of the games. The lockers had been trashed. I think that's all that they mentioned was those two pranks. Mm-hmm. Well, they they keep calling them practical jokes or mm-hmm. pranks, and they're they're not. These are mm-hmm. not practical jokes. These are very serious things that could have seriously injured someone. And I just had to laugh every time they said that these practical jokes that almost got everyone killed. Ha ha. Yeah, okay. It's not like somebody <laughs> filled up a bunch of water cups and put them all over the floor, or right. <laughs> put saran wrap on the toilets, or something. It's like no, they damaged property, right. and like you know, set off a smoke bomb that could have damaged like the health of your players. You know, right. like it's not like it was a stink bomb; it was a smoke bomb, and yeah. But also, I just thought it was strange that there was only like two things that they described they did make it seem like there might have been more right but they didn't mention any more and i was like there's only been two occurrences of this why are you so stressed out about it you know what i mean like it just why do you have to bring in a detective (laughs) yeah it just seemed a little bit preemptive but maybe they just weren't telling us about more that had happened i don't know i guess so We also learn that um, the reason why they have called in Nancy, this amateur detective, is because the campus police haven't been of much help because there is also currently a string of assaults happening on campus um, where someone is literally just going around and beating people up pretty, pretty severely. Um, And so that is why that they have they kind of need the help. They kind of need Nancy's help uh, because of that. So we, we have this conversation with the coach and all of a sudden there's a bunch of commotion coming from the gym, a bunch of stuff going on. And they're like, OK, let's run down the hall and see what's going on. Um, they run into the gym and they see that a dummy has been hung from the basketball hoop. And at first they 
kind of think that it's someone who has been hung, yeah. right? It, but they realize it is just a dummy that's been stuffed with like packing peanuts and stuff. And um, it's got a wildcat's uniform on and it's got a sign hanging around its neck that says death to the wildcats. It's very unnerving. Yikes. Uh, yikes. Yeah, so Nancy kind of immediately jumps into action. She gets the coach mm-hmm. to like, or the coach sends the players, you know, to the showers or whatever, because there's a game that night. So he's having them prepare for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and she immediately kind of puts uh, Bess and George to work. She sends George to walk around the outside of the building to see if all, check, make sure that all of the doors were locked and that nobody could get in through other any other entrance but the main entrance. Mm-hmm. And then she sends Bess to talk to the security guard and check the sign-in sheet or whatever to see um, if it was possible for anybody to get into the building. And they report back that all the exits on the outside of the building are locked. You can't get in through them. They only open from the inside. And that anybody who comes into the athletic complex either has to show their student ID or sign the guest ledger. And the only people who have signed the guest ledger that day are Nancy, Bess, and George. Right. So Nancy concludes that this is a an, an Emerson student um, who is pulling off these quote unquote pranks. Right. Must be someone affiliated with the team. Right. So Ned asked Nancy to accompany him to his fraternity's party that night after the game. Yeah. He also shows them to the dorm where they will be staying. Oh yeah. Um, apparently Nancy is deemed as some kind of special visitor to the school. And (laughs) with that, she is allowed to stay in this special dorm that they allow for visitors visitors. yeah that was bizarre to me um but okay it's not important (laughs) we also learn that the party that ned invited them to is being held by his fraternity omega chi epsilon Mm -hmm. (laughs) i just i um i just really appreciated that um obviously that's something that we hear in the computer games a lot and so i just i appreciated that consistency Yes. Um, And then later at the game, they're on their way to the big basketball game. And outside, we see a bunch of protesters protesting something. And as we get closer, um, we see that they're protesting the amount of money given to the athletic department and the school budget. And that these um, protests are being held by a guy named Tom Stafford. Mm -hmm. Who is also the student body president, right? Right, right, right. Um, he kind of gets into a little bit of an argument with Nancy and George in particular because mm. <laughs> George like really defends um, the budget, I guess. Here she's like, athletic athletics are expensive, and you it's know, blah, 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 right? And he's like, typical jock, all broad, no brains, or whatever. And that Nancy really is, gets to George. <laughs> so offend- Nancy's really offended too. Um, and she's like, what a crazy loon. Or she says something, she says something about how he's, he's crazy. Mm-hmm. And um, they kind of move past it. But it's a really awkward moment. I also just thought, I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. Give my comments. Y'all, G- George and Nancy, you don't know anything about this school's budget. You don't right. know how much money they're allocating to the athletic department. How on earth are you supposed to be saying whether or not, like, how do you, ha- how can you have an opinion on this protest? You know right. what I mean? Anyway. <laughs> also, I mean, not not related at all. Maybe I should save it for later. But, well, at least nowadays. I don't know what it was like back in 1987. But usually the athletic departments will kind of sponsor themselves. Like, they fund mm-hmm. everything through ticket sales and everything like that. It's not money that would have otherwise gone to academics that is being allocated to athletics. It's athletics kind of made their own money. And they're, maybe they take some money from the university itself. But usually... Usually it's all self-contained, if that makes sense. Maybe, unless they're really unsuccessful. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But it doesn't seem like the Wildcats are. It seems like right. people, there's a lot of hype around these games, and they're almost to the finals. So, um, right. yeah, so that doesn't seem to be the case in this situation. So. Right, and if it were the case, then academic money shouldn't be going to them anyway, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting, yeah, but definitely, definitely an interesting moment. Mm-hmm. Oh, Stafford, he also, uh, Tom also insults Ned because she oh, yeah. says something like, oh, well, my boyfriend Ned isn't a jock like that. He has good grades and things. And Tom insults him. And I don't remember what he calls him exactly. But oh, I'll, I'll find it. The big Nick. huh? Well, congratulate. Oh, OK. OK. So he does. He just calls him the big Nick. 
But okay. um, he does imply something kind of strange. He says, I hope you're enjoying your share of the school's money. Oh, and yeah. Nancy is really confused by this. She's like, what? And he says, don't you and Ned toast the trustees when you're out on the, the town? Um, and she's like, what is that? Like, what do our dates have anything to do with the school money? But they are kind of pushed inside before she could get an answer to that. Mm -hmm. But definitely, definitely very interested. So they're at the game and they're enjoying the game and they're all screaming and cheering really, really hard. Um, and then suddenly a scream rings out through the gym. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though the mascot's uniform has been torn to shreds. She was apparently taking a quick break in the locker room. Um, and when she came back out, someone had cut up the Wildcat mascot uniform. Mm -hmm. This kind of disturbs the basketball game. So mm -hmm. the team is kind of shaken up by this, I guess, or they're at least upset by this. And they start to perform worse in the second right. part of the game. And But they do just scrape a win. The margin is close, but they do scrape a win. Mm -hmm. But then, yes, they go to the game. They go, or they go to the party. Yes. Um, Jeez Louise. <laughs> Where do we start with this party? Um... I guess that, so kind of right off the bat, Ned and Nancy find some time to talk. Um, and Ned gives her a beautiful silver bracelet and they kiss. <laughs> and Nancy feels better. Nancy's like, okay, so it's probably, it was probably just the distance. Now that we're back together, um, you know, we'll warm back up, whatever. Well, uh, things are, things are going to be fine. I was maybe just imagining it, right? I'll start um, visiting more often. Yeah. Right, 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 right. We meet all. We meet a, quite a few people at this party, also. So we meet mm -hmm. uh, Ray Unger, who is a very, very bitter and angry guy, um, who was cut from the Wildcats because he had a poor GPA, apparently, mm -hmm. and he is he is really fired up about it, and apparently hates the Wildcats now and the the coach who he feels like had that out for him. Um, he also lightly threatens Nancy, which I thought was super strange. Mm -hmm. He um, He's like, oh, you know, nosy Nancy Drew or whatever. You better be careful where you put your nose or um, it'll get cut off. Um, which was like weird. It was super weird because it's also like, like, why are you concerned about her investigating something? Uh, who knows? Yep. But yeah, so he's a really angry guy. We meet him. We meet some other of Ned's friends. We meet our token black character who yes. we don't, um, you know, hear anything else about <laughs> later. Nancy shakes the hands of a black youth. Mm -hmm. That's how they say it. Yep. Yep. And all um, right. <laughs> and um, Bess also remarks on the um, appearance of all of these basketball players that they are, well, one, incredibly hunky, but also, two, incredibly well dressed. And Nancy thought that this was strange, too, because she knew quite a few of the people that Bess had pointed out were scholarship students. Mm -hmm. And so she wasn't sure how scholarship students could get such nice clothes. Mm -hmm. Gucci shoes and mm -hmm. some nice watches and stuff. So that was interesting. But then Nancy needs to go to the bathroom. So she kind of wanders down the hall looking for the bathroom. Of course, in a frat house, all the doors look the same. So she just kind of pushes on a random door, goes in, finds that it's actually someone's bedroom. And whoops, okay, obviously shouldn't be in here. But nobody's in here. So I'm Nancy Drew. I'm going to snoop around, obviously. <laughs> Yes, for sure. To be fair to Nancy, though, the reason why she does it is because she notices a picture on the, I guess, the nightstand next to one of the beds or something. And it's a picture of Ned and Mike. And she knows it's not Ned's bedroom because apparently she's been to Ned's bedroom oh. at this fraternity. She does. She notes that in passing. Um, so she figures it must be Mike's. But then she accidentally, I guess, while she's walking toward this picture to look at it, she kicks um, a box that is like halfway under the bed or on the floor or something. Mm -hmm. And she looks down and it's a box that is full of styrofoam, packing peanuts, scraps of cloth and half of a pillowcase, which is the same stuff that was made to use the dummy that was just hung off of the basketball hoop earlier that day. So obviously this is soups suspicious but Nancy doesn't get a whole lot of time to ponder this until a threatening figure looms in the doorway behind her. 
but it's okay because it's just Ned. Right. Except that Ned comes in quite angrily and says, Nancy, what are you doing in here? Why are you snooping around? It's like, first of all, Ned, don't you know your girlfriend at all? (laughs) (laughs) Of course she's snooping. But they end up getting into quite a big fight about this. Ned is, uh, you know, Nancy shows him what she's found and says, it's a good thing I stumbled in here because look at this evidence against Mike. It looks like Mike's the one who made the dummy, right? And Ned's mm-hmm. like, how can you accuse my best friend of this? He's not that kind of guy. I can't believe that you would think that he is <laughs> responsible for that. I'm sorry. I find this, I find this argument ridiculous, but. It was so painful. <laughs> I've known for him for two whole years. How dare you think I don't know him well enough to vouch for him? And there's plenty of reasons someone would have the exact same materials and half the pillowcase when the other half was on the dummy and like cross him off your suspect list, Nancy. I'm sure that we will talk about this fight much, much more after we finish summarizing. But I have to say that I feel like Nancy is incredibly fair throughout this, at least this this part of the argument because she she tries very hard to see from Ned's perspective and talk about it calmly and rationally but Ned is fired up about mm. it and he um and Nancy kind of end up just walking away without it being resolved right yeah so oh it's so painful huh? it is really painful <laughs> Um, back at the dorm Nancy's still they're walking back to the dorm and Nancy is you know kind of just like thinking about this fight, wondering, you know, did she do something wrong? You know, how can she kind of reconcile with Ned? So she's going to stay outside and take a walk, do a little bit more walking. And and Bess and George head back upstairs into the dorm. But right as she's like about to walk away, Bess runs back downstairs and says, Nancy, we have to leave immediately. Nancy's mm-hmm. like, what are you talking about? Apparently someone has trashed their dorm room and written on the wall go home drew <laughs> very completely ransack the place yeah <laughs> and so you know they call dorm advisor they call the security guard in the dorm i also thought this was a really weird <laughs> exchange mm-hmm. but it ends up being okay you know no permanent damage was done or whatever and nancy kind of talks bess and george down and of course they continue their investigation so they decide to stay yeah yeah um nancy does ask the guard you know who can get into this dorm or whatever and he says that pretty much anybody can because all the students in the dorm have a key to the side door and a lot of times uh, kids make copies to give out to their friends so pretty much anybody could have gotten in um and so that doesn't really narrow the suspect pool at all Let's see. Nancy goes to a payphone. Is this the next day? Yes. Yeah. The next day. Yeah. So the next day, Nancy goes to a payphone because she's going to call Ned, try to patch things up a little bit with him. But while she's like waiting to use the phone, she overhears this guy that she immediately starts referring to as attractive, calls him a hunk and Uh uh, overhears him having a very bizarre phone call on the payphone next to her and um, something about Captain Hook. Yeah, he calls himself Captain Hook. He says, it's Captain Hook yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> and then just says a bunch of other really strange stuff. Um, hangs up the phone and he leaves. And Nancy notices that he's left a little scrap of paper behind. So she takes a scrap of paper because she's like, that, that was just really strange. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this in case. Well, I do specifically want to know exactly what he said because it does have some significance later. So he says, yes. what's the line on tomorrow? And he says, let me have a 10 timer. Nancy doesn't understand what this means yet. She obviously will figure it out later. But just just for your knowledge, in case you know what that means, regular Drews. I didn't know what this means. I had an idea of what it was about. It seemed a little, a little obvious to me what okay. was going on. But I don't know if it was just the fact that it was about sports. And I was like, well, obviously, like, obviously. Right. <laughs> Anyway, we'll get to it. We'll get to it, regular Drews. So then she does call Ned, and she sets up a date with him, a dinner and a movie. Um, And she tries to say something on the phone to him because she feels bad. She kind of wants to try to apologize. But he says, save it. And he hangs up on her. Yeah. That's not nice, Ned. Mm. Mm -hmm. So then they go on that date, and it's the worst date ever. (laughs) Nancy even says that it is the worst date they ever had. Mm-hmm. Just really, really awkward the whole time. They get into another argument during dinner about, well, Nancy 
takes Ned, Ned's hand. It's like, you know, I want to apologize about how I handled things. I really should have tried to see things from your way. And he was like, okay, so, you know, you've crossed Mike off your suspect list. And she's like, what are you talking about? No, of course I'm not crossing him off the suspect list. He's still very much a suspect. I'm just sorry about the way everything came out to you. And he was like, oh, well, then we're still fighting. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But and so, yeah, he ends up just dropping her off back at the dorm. He doesn't even hug her goodbye, say goodbye or whatever. He just drives off. Um, Awkward. Um, But immediately, Nancy doesn't have time to dwell on any of this, really, because immediately, as soon as Ned turns the corner, a black Camaro heads for her at top speed. Well, first, a guy comes running out of the building. Right, right. Guy comes running out of the building, gets into the black Camaro and starts to like run Nancy down in his car. Mm -hmm. She dives out of the way, but couldn't, didn't see the car in time to get the license plate. But pretty quickly, she hears sirens. She starts to realize that the guy was actually fleeing something else. He wasn't trying to hurt her necessarily, maybe, but he had just come from somewhere else. And so she follows the sirens and finds that a man lying in a stairwell beaten. So this is another assault victim of the string of assaults that have been happening around campus. So the cops are there, yeah, taking a statement from the guy, and he says that he didn't see his attacker, which Nancy is really confused about. She says that he's lying because he had to have seen his attacker because of how beaten up he was. This attack would have taken several minutes, Um, and so it didn't seem likely that throughout that time he wouldn't have been able to see what the attacker looked like. So Nancy does tell the cops what the guy slightly looks like. She only saw his height and kind of his build, so she gives a description of that to the police and the boy also begs the police not to call his parents interesting which like you're in college they can't call your parents because you're an adult like anyway. <laughs> yeah 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 but not what school, i was working on right. is like interesting that if you've just been a victim of an assault like you don't want you're acting guilty in some way right you're right, acting like right. you don't want other people to know about this for some reason right weird Weird. Very weird. So the next day, Nancy runs into Tom Stafford again at another protest. Go figure. I think he just likes to protest. Sounds like it. <laughs> just fair. This one is to is protesting illegal payments made to Emerson athletes. Mm-hmm. And Nancy is like, what is this about? And so she goes up to talk to him. He's talking to a reporter, apparently. And she's like, what are you talking about illegal payments to Emerson athletes? And the reporter asks him, does he have any proof for this? And he's like, no, I don't have any proof. But Nancy knows all about it. Ask (laughs) Nancy. And Nancy's like, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about illegal payments made to Emerson (laughs) athletes. Mm -hmm. But she has kind of a thought in the back of her mind. Because she remembers all the really well-dressed scholarship students. And she remembers the nice and shiny silver bracelet that Ned just bought her. Mm -hmm. And so now she, she of course, denies any, all of this. But in the back of her mind, she's like, is Ned taking illegal payments for, you know, being part of the basketball team? Her heart sinks. You can feel it reading this. Oh, Mm -hmm. it's so awful. Mm -hmm thinking that she might even have to suspect Ned. Yeah. Ugh, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so she wanders around campus kind of like in a, a state and she's trying to find Ned because she wants to talk to Ned about this. She's like, mm-hmm. this can't be true. I have to ask him um, or whatever. But so she goes to the athletic complex and instead of finding Ned, she finds a firing range in this athletic complex and Ray Unger is in there and he holds a gun to her neck. Yeah. Like grabs her from behind and holds a gun to her neck and like pulls her into the shooting range room. Okay. As as a joke? As a joke. Because she like pushes him away or whatever. And he like makes a joke about it. And she notices that there's no cartridge clip in the gun. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm sorry. What? Still. She says to him. She's like, I should report you to whoever is in charge of this range. And he's like, well, we can't take a joke or whatever. I'm sorry. Fuck men. Fuck That's not a joke. (laughs) That's not a joke. Holding a gun to someone is not a joke. It's not a joke. Not a joke. It's not funny. Not funny. She has such a bad sense of humor because she wouldn't let me threaten her life. (laughs) 
What a bitch. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Uh, screw you, Ray. But also, why is there a firing range on campus? Why are students allowed to have firearms on campus? Oh, yeah. We'll talk about this. Because this, <laughs> mm, this really got to me. Anyway. I didn't really understand the whole point of this scene other than to realize that Ray um, is a little bit more dangerous than we possibly think. And also, he knows how to use a gun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Pretty well, we might add. But we'll right. Yeah. Right. He's at least practicing. Yes. And he's, yeah, he's just in there playing with guns. That's pretty much all that happens other than the, the yeah. practical joke. Mm-hmm. And so, but we don't find it, Ned. We end up right. not being able to find Ned. But um, so Nancy heads back to the dorm where Bess tells her that, hey, guess what? We've got a ride on the team bus to the game tonight. And Nancy is like, great, great. I get to sit on a bus, an awkward bus next to my boyfriend who I'm currently having a massive fight with Mm -hmm. (laughs) while he's about to play basketball game. This is going to be super great. Super awesome. Can't wait. (laughs) But so they get on the bus and Nancy does not sit with Ned. She sits with George, Mm -hmm. which is, is, it's so painful. It's so awkward. I can just feel the tension, Mm -hmm. just like the palpable tension between the two of them. We also learn that Mike is not on this bus. Mike is going to be driving himself to the game. Um, and this is like a weird. <laughs> so as soon as we get on the bus, this team member named Howie, he apparently has these lucky socks. They call him socks because he has these lucky socks he always wears to the game. He opens up his gym bag and the lucky socks are missing. <laughs> I also note that the coach and the assistant coaches are not on the bus either because all of the like adult staff has taken, mm-hmm. I guess, their own cars or have taken one car together, but they're not on the bus and neither is Mike. But the rest of the team is there with, with Nancy, Bess, and George. Great and note. no socks. Great note. And no socks. Missing <laughs> socks. So I guess this is the, what, fourth prank? <laughs> right. This is probably the least prankster? harmful. Yeah, great so far as stealing socks. It absolutely never comes up again either. We don't find out about how he's missing socks, which is like not exactly the end of the world. But it's also just like, why is this in there anyway? Nancy, you left him hanging. You could have found the socks for him, and you didn't. <laughs> Nancy, you failed. Um. Anyway, they're driving to the game, and as they're driving to the game, Nancy sees the black Camaro drive up alongside of the bus. And an arm sticks out of the window of the black Camaro with a gun. And he shoots one of the, sorry, they shoot. We don't know the gender of this person. They shoot out the front tire of the bus. And the bus goes skidding and starts to tip over. But it doesn't. The bus driver is able to regain control of the bus. Gets it back on the road and everybody's okay. Nobody is hurt. But they do have to wait another hour for another bus to come pick them up to take them to the game. And Mm -hmm. so they get to the game really late and almost have to get directly onto the court to start. Also, the team does not realize that this is what's happened. The bus driver just thinks that they've had a tire Mm -hmm. blowout and that's why there was the sound and you know he kind of blames himself for this happening Um, and Nancy obviously knows what's going on but she chooses not to say anything to the team because she thinks it's just going to shake their nerves even even more yeah I mean honestly good call right right (laughs) if I knew somebody was shooting at our car I'd be like um I'm gonna go home you know (laughs) so they do make it to the game on time but the whole game is kind of stressful and hectic and again they barely scrape a win but they do win Mm. they do win yeah Back at the dorm, they make it back to the dorm after the game, and Nancy sees the Camaro parked in the dorm parking lot. So she goes up to try to see the license plate, to get the license plate for the car. But the car roars to life, and he starts to peel out of there. But Nancy (laughs) thinks really quickly. (laughs) And really luckily, there are just these empty steel drums to the entrance of this drive that he's on. So she pushes them over so that he can't get out of the driveway. So instead, someone jumps out of the car and flees. And of course, they chase him. They chase him into a heating plant that Mm -hmm. is apparently the heating plant for the school. On campus, yeah. Yeah, and down into tunnels under the school, but he gets away. And the car gets away too, so they're not, they don't even get the plates for the car either and nancy kicks herself for this yeah um because she she re- knows she should have sent besser george to go look at the plates on the car while she was chasing the guy but 
she did it. And um, he gets away and we get no more clues from that, um, that experience. Bummer. The next morning at breakfast, though, Bess is sitting there reading the school newspaper and learns that Tom actually has an alibi for this whole event because he was leading a debate the night before at the same time as the game. So that clears him of both the incident with the Camaro after the game and the, the shooting of the tire. Right. So Nancy goes to find Ned again because she I guess she just really wants to talk to him at this point. Um, and she does find him in the athletic building this time. Um, he's watching a video of a recent game and they fight some more. <laughs> it's it's oh, the same it's stuff so- over again, you know, about how um, Nancy still suspects Mike and Ned's still so upset that she could think that Mike could be responsible for this and doesn't she trust Ned's opinion of him or whatever. But As they're kind of fighting, Nancy sees something on the tape and she asks him to back it up. And we find out that it's Ray Unger at this basketball team. And so she's like, oh, thank goodness. Okay, hey, Ned, look, there's Ray Unger. I think that Ray Unger lied to us. Ray Unger said that he never goes to any Wildcats baseball games. He hates the Wildcats. Mm -hmm. Why is he at a Wildcats uh, basketball game? Did I say baseball? Mm, I don't think so. Did you? I might have said baseball. No, it's okay. If I said baseball, I meant basketball. Okay. (laughs) Um, What is he doing at a game? He must be there to enjoy the outcome of his practical jokes. Right. And so Ned's like, oh, yes, yay. It's not Mike. Great. But then Nancy. Let's play it again. Let's back it up again. Back it up. Play it again. Play it over. And we see that Ray is cheering on the Wildcats. Mm-hmm. She's like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would he be cheering at this basketball game? Especially if he's trying to ruin their chances of getting into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Why would he want them to succeed? Doesn't add up. And Ned's like, well, I'm not helping you anymore if that's how you're going to be. Yeah. So she takes it back. She's like, oh, never mind. I guess that doesn't eliminate, or I guess that uh, does eliminate Ray as a suspect. I don't think he would, you know, be cheering or whatever. And he's like, what are you talking about, Nancy? You just said that. That he was responsible. Now you're saying he's not responsible. What are you talking about? And she says basically that she will not rest. She gets really angry and hot at this point. And she is like, okay, well, fine. I am going to prove that I am right and that Mike is guilty. If you want your evidence, I'm going to get you some evidence, Ned. Yikes. I'm going to do it. (laughs) Yikes. Um, Oh. So that night. She sneaks into the athletic building, hides in the girls' locker room bathroom until midnight when the security guards leave, and sneaks down into the basketball boys' locker room and breaks into Mike's locker. She lockpicks it open. I have added that as a skill. Nancy's skill is actually, I think she's done that before, but um, she did it in the dark this time. (laughs) Yeah. And she finds $2,000 in the locker along with a list of Emerson opponents with negative numbers beside their names. So she's like, okay, well, I mean, even if this doesn't prove Mike's guilt, um, he's certainly up to something. Why would he have $2,000 in his locker if he wasn't up to something? And so she's right. like, you know, victory <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but she... Suddenly, she hears someone coming down the hallway. So she goes to hide. And what does Nancy do? She picks the another great hiding spot. She hides in a sauna, in the team sauna in the locker room. Where has this worked out poorly for us before? Hmm. Um, this is quite a nice little creek moment, I just have to say. Um, because she gets trapped in the sauna. Someone traps her inside of the sauna and cranks it up not just that they push a set of lockers in front of the door so it's pretty much impossible for her to get out Mm -hmm. this was a very tense scene i was freaking out (laughs) um she thinks she's like okay do i scream for help but nobody's in the building um you know she's looking around there's nothing in the sauna really for her to use there's the bench that's like it and so she doesn't she has no way to get out she doesn't know what to do but she keeps her head our Nancy Drew, great in a crisis. And she, so she takes off all her clothes pretty much. Not, she's not naked, but she <laughs> takes off like her sweater um, and her shoes and her socks and everything. Her sweat skirt. <laughs> her sweat skirt. And she realizes, she's like, okay, Nancy, what's around the light? 
in the top of the sauna. I do not know where she got the idea to do this, but it is genius. I don't know if it would actually work. I was thinking that because maybe it would be on two different systems, the light and the heater, but whatever. But somehow she gets the metal part of her belt, right? Or of a pen. She has a pen. pen. That's what it is. She has a pen in her pocket or whatever. And she wraps the leather of her belt around her hand and takes the pen and sticks it into the light. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. (laughs) Don't do this. I mean, if your life is in danger, I mean, fair enough. But so she sticks it into the light to short it out and it shorts out the heating in the sauna so that it stops heating up. Right. She's like, great. Okay, but now what do I do? Because I'm still stuck in here. It's still hot. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I can't She's get like out. She's like passing out at this point, basically. Mm-hmm. She is so exhausted that she wants to lay down and go to sleep, she says. But so she punches the window out of the door because there's a little window in the door badass Nancy Drew moment to get some fresh air. And then she is able to take off part of the wood on the wooden bench in there, stick it out the door and use it as kind of a lever to like lift and push the lockers just away from the door just enough so that she can get it open and squeeze out. Nancy Drew. Amazing. This, I don't know about you, but this is when I figured it out. Figure out yeah. Who the bad guy was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, what a horrible, horrible thing to do to someone. Just leave them to sleep. Like, heat Die to death. of heat stroke in a sauna. That's In the dark. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's not cold because it's in a sauna, but that's cold. Right. It's, <laughs> she's going to cook Nancy to death. Ugh. Ugh. Crazy. Horrid. So Nancy is even more fired up than she was before. She's like, nobody tries to kill Nancy Drew and get away with it. So I am 100% going to stick this out until I find out who this is. Mm-hmm. Next day, Nancy, uh, Bess and George are like trying to tell Nancy, like, Nancy, you got to take it easy. You got to rest or whatever. And Nancy is like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. And they're just kind of like, okay, <laughs> I guess. I guess we'll go along because you're the alpha in our group and we have to listen to you. If one of my friends, if you, Corey, had just almost passed out in a sauna, I would be like, we're going to the doctor. Yeah, let's, let's go home at least. Like, <laughs> like, or just like take a freaking nap. Like, we're not I think this is the next morning, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but she still. She says she didn't sleep well that night. She didn't sleep because she, she was so upset. Well, Nancy, you're dehydrated. Let me start there. <laughs> You need to have a glass of water and you need to sleep for eight hours and then you can resume your mystery. I will say, like, I appreciate, I understand that Nancy Drew is the detective and there's lots of tropes about the detective, you know, kind of running themselves ragged to solve a crime. But I don't appreciate this message that we send to young girls. Um, We need Nancy to be able to take care of herself, to be able to take care of her body physically. Um, And I would really appreciate it if Nancy took better care of herself, um, right. showed a little bit more concern about her own well-being. I think that would be appropriate. She would do a lot better solving the mystery if mm-hmm. she was like physically better, more, you know, mm-hmm. mentally all there rather than running herself ragged. So Right, right, right. Anyway, she's fired up um, and she, uh, she's... She decides oh, to go talk to yeah, Mike, right? To Mike, yeah. Um, she runs into Mike's girlfriend. I thought this was a weird uh, scene. Jan. I'll talk mm-hmm. about why I think it's weird later. Um, she runs into Jan, who is really upset. She tells Nancy that Mike has been moody and irritable lately. And apparently he just disappears with no explanation of where he's going or where he's been. Hmm. Suspicious. So she goes to find Mike. She confronts him. She says, hey. I know that you're, you know, responsible for these pranks and you need to fess up. You need to confess. And he tells Nancy that, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. Basically, he doesn't admit anything. But he does say that she made him realize that he's been being stupid about something and that he has something to go take care of. And he gets up and he walks out. It's so strange. He's just like, thanks, Nancy. Bye. Mm-hmm. We learned mm-hmm. nothing from that. We learned nothing. And so Nancy is kind of confused. She's like, what was he talking about? He had something to go do. You know, why didn't he just say it? If, you know, it's what it looks like it is. Why didn't he confess to it? Um, and so she's walking out after Mike has left. I guess it's been a few minutes or whatever. And she's walking towards the building. And then she sees 
police. And apparently someone else has been assaulted. So she goes around into the building to try to see who it was. And it was Captain Hook who had called earlier. He had been assaulted. And so now she's even more confused because she's like, did Mike just leave the building and come to do this? Is this the thing that he said he had to go take care of? That's bizarre. That's a weird thing to say if you're about to go assault someone. So she's just kind of, she's like, something isn't adding up. Something doesn't make sense here. And so she says, okay, I got to go somewhere to like sit down and think about this. So she goes to the library where she spots Ray Unger sitting there and studying. And she's like, hmm, what is Ray Unger doing in here on a Saturday studying? (laughs) He should be in the creepy firing range under the gymnasium (laughs) threatening women. What is he doing studying? (laughs) So she goes to talk to him, which I'm like, Nancy, this boyfriend you with a a gun the other day. Stay clear. But she goes to talk to him and he basically tells her that like all this vileness that he's been spewing is just a front because he doesn't want people to feel bad for him for being kicked off the team because of his low grades. And he's studying so that he can raise his GPA so that he can get back onto the team. He's actually very genuine about his love for the team and his teammates and wants to be there for him. And that's why that he went to the game so that he could cheer them on and still feel like he's part of the team even though he's not on it this semester we're gonna have to talk about this later because geez (laughs) nancy's immediately like okay well that was genuine so (laughs) cross him off the suspect list gun waving maniac yeah 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 yeah, 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 so ray's cleared for some reason for some reason was heartfelt enough in his reason for studying (laughs) <laughs> this okay let's oh i have so much to say i have so 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 much to say about this especially as it relates to nancy's fight with ned so we are gonna have to come back to this okay so because we're getting we're getting close to the the big reveal here guys so today is the day of the big game there's a pep rally that they go to to get fired up for the game and it's you know the whole thing where they like call the team members in one by one so everybody can cheer for them And Mike hasn't shown up. And so Ned is going to have to go out there and basically cover for him as his co-captain, which he's kind of upset about. And so Nancy is standing outside of the gym with the coach. And she asks him about the money. Um, You know, is it true that you're paying your players to play? And he says, no, absolutely not. And if something like that were going on, I would know about it. Nancy, again, also trusts him for some reason. Right. Thinks he's being genuine. And then he's like, so Nancy, you know, tonight's the night of the big game. Have you caught the practical joker? And she's like about to tell him that, yes, I have. And it's Mike. But at that exact moment, someone runs into the building and says, coach, Mike just fell off the roof. Oh my god! Oh, this is uh, every time we come to something new, it's just more stressful than mm-hmm. the last thing. Oh. And so they run outside, and we see Mike has indeed fallen off the roof. It's like sixty feet from the roof to the ground, and he's landed in like a foot of snow, which might have cushioned his blow a little bit. But he is very, very injured, and so luckily the ambulance was there for the game tonight, and so the ambulance comes around and. As, you know, they're about to get to him or whatever, Mike calls for Nancy. It's like, I've got to talk to Nancy Drew. And he basically has this, he's about to say, like, Nancy, you know, I, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, whatever. And then they, the paramedics yell at Nancy to get away from him. And so he doesn't get to tell her who is responsible for this. <sighs> But then Nancy looks up and she sees that there's like a barrier around the rim of the top of the building. And she's thinking, hmm, that's pretty high. How did Mike fall from there unless he was pushed? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, that's it until they get to the game, the game. And Nancy is there and she feels bad because she hasn't been able to find out who the practical joker is or whatever. But as they're sitting there, she overhears two players on the bench say, it's going to be a push. 
They're like talking to each other. And they're like bickering as well. Right. And then those two players get onto the court and brush up against Ned somehow and make him fall. Yeah, like one comes from the front and one comes from the back and like knock him over and mm-hmm. and my and um Ned is injured from this. The team doctor takes him off the court and and Ned's like, "Put me back in, coach," or whatever. And <laughs> the doctor is like, "Absolutely not. I'm not letting you back out on the court to, you know, potentially injure yourself further or whatever." And so he takes him out of the game and George says, Oh, I bet the other team is happy about that. And Nancy has an iconic light bulb moment. This is when she solves it. Oh, I got it. And she's like, but first I have to call my dad. (laughs) We call Carson. We do. We call Carson. We don't actually get to hear anything from Carson. We just hear Nancy's side of the conversation, which I was a little disappointed about. But she talks to her dad. And he basically confirms that, yes, she's on the right track. Us as the reader, we still don't know what exactly Nancy has figured out yet because we do have a reveal coming. So she goes to confront, like, drum roll. Like, this is after the game? No. During the game? I think it's during the game. I think it's, like, toward the end of the game because yeah, by yeah. the time all this is over, game's over and everyone right. has gone home. Right. But, yeah. But the game is still going on at this point. So Nancy goes, you know – you know, back into the gym and confronts Dr. Riggs, the team doctor. As she goes to his office, he is like stuffing files and notebooks into a gym bag. And she says, hey, I know that you are running a gambling ring and you are purposefully trying to influence the score of the game by recruiting the team's own players to help sabotage themselves, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, did we talk about going to the hospital with Mike? Nope. Might have missed that. Okay. Yes. Definitely missed that. That was pre-game, post-pep rally. They went to the hospital with Mike, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, yeah. I skipped that totally. He isn't ever going to play basketball again. Yeah, he's injured. He's he's going to live. He will probably walk again. But definitely no basketball is going to be in his future. Ned is like really hurt by this for Mike thinking like, you know, Mike wanted to go pro. This is going to be absolutely devastating to him. So it's kind of a, just a hard moment for for everyone. Yeah. It's sad. So yeah. So she's confronting Dr. Riggs and he is like, you're very smart, Miss Drew, whatever, you know, Um, Mm. he doesn't admit anything really to her though, but he does pull out a gun. So Mm -hmm. Pretty sure that Nancy's on the right track here and holds her at gunpoint and makes her write a note to her friends that says, like, go wait in the student union. You know, I'll be there in an hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Bess and George are outside the door this right. whole time. And Nancy's like, I'm not going to tell you who's the bad guy, but if you hear yeah. me scream, go get the police. And Ugh. then just kind of leaves it at that and just keeps them in the dark for all of this. So they get this note, take it at face value, and then they leave and go to the student union. and. Mm-hmm. Now the building is pretty much completely empty except for Nancy and Dr. Riggs. Mm -hmm. And he, while he's holding her at gunpoint, he calls someone up on the phone. We don't know who um, and waits for them to get there. Eventually they do get there, kind of like grab a hold of Nancy and they chloroform her, which isn't this a myth? Didn't like, isn't there a thing like chloroform doesn't work this quickly? Oh, maybe he does anyway. say something really sinister. He's like, take a deeper breath because it'll make it go quicker for you. And like, Ugh. Ugh. Creepy. Creepy, 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 creepy. So Nancy's pretty much like, I'm going to die. This is how I'm killed. It's very dark. And it could have been. Literally, yeah. he could have just shot her or stabbed her or done anything to her while she was unconscious. It's really dark. because So she wakes up. And she's just alone with this guy who she apparently recognizes. Oh, she doesn't recognize him. She guesses that his name is Frank because she heard Captain Hook say it to him on the phone. Mm -hmm. Holding her at gunpoint. Alone in the basement of this, the, you know, gymnasium or whatever. Like, he could have done anything to her. We learned that he is the driver of the Camaro. So he's Mm -hmm. been the one going around beating up students who can't pay or who don't pay up when they lose their bets about the basketball games. Right, right. And so they have like this really creepy conversation or whatever where Nancy's like, I have to like stall him or whatever because I know that he is about to 
basically take me somewhere to kill me. Um, and as she starts kind of waking up, he basically confirms that as like, okay, you know, let's go to your death. And he bends down to pick up some uh, rope to like, I guess, bind her hands with or something. Mm -hmm. And as he bends down, Nancy kicks him directly in the face. Yes. <laughs> so she like brings her foot right up, smacks him in the face. It's not enough to knock him unconscious, but she does not hang around to find out. She runs she flees she goes around to all of the doors trying to get out of the building but all of the doors are locked and she can't get out so she ends up in the gym where they are uh, it's empty everybody has gone home from the game but there are a bunch of floats i guess parked in there from uh, whatever parade That's had happened rally. earlier and she is able she to get one <laughs> gets into a jeep that is attached to one of the floats so there are no car keys in here. So we find out that Nancy knows how to hotwire a car. Can we read this part too? Because yes. she's so nonchalant about it. She would have to hotwire it, she realized. But how could she do that without giving herself away? One sound and she was dead. Reaching under the dashboard, she located the ignition wires. She tugged them down and began to twist them together. How did it go? Red and the white, the black and the green. If she got out of this alive, she promised herself she would practice stealing cars until she could do it blindfolded. <laughs> Nancy! <laughs> Woohoo! I thought that was I, awesome. You know, it's the best moment. It's the greatest moment. <laughs> I was so happy that Nancy knew how to hotwire a car. It's like, of course she does. Of course mm -hmm. she does. So she gets the car to start, and drives it through the gym doors. Well, first Frank catches up to her, shoots the front windshield out. So Nancy's like driving this car, ducked down, can't even see where she's going. And she's like honking on the horn, trying to get him to get out of the way so she doesn't run him over on her trip out the door. But she's not all that bothered about it. She's just <laughs> going for it. If he gets run over, he gets run over. <laughs> yeah, and he eventually does jump out of the way. But she drives through the gym doors out into the parking lot. And luckily, right at that moment, Bess, George, and Ned are coming with the police. So mm -hmm. she's safe. So the day is safe. <laughs> Woo! Um, yeah. This so, felt like Veronica Mars, the season three finale where oh she's running. Oh, it was so stressful. That same. Uh, was yeah. Totally the vibe where she's mm -hmm. like running in the dorm trying to get away. Oh, okay. and she's like half drugged and like stumbling. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh. y'all. If y'all have not watched Veronica Mars, I'm sure many of you have because it is truly a modern day Nancy Drew show, but you just have to. You just have to do that. Will not spoil anything for that. I refuse to. You have to go watch it. Yes. ASAP. It is but same great show. vibes for this. So. Exact same vibes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we find out also in this moment that Bess and George saved Mike, basically. After they mm -hmm. had gone to the student union and waited a while, they realized that something was up. So they went to the hospital, I guess, to try to find Nancy there um, or mm -hmm. find Ned to try to, you know, go rescue Nancy. And instead, they see Dr. Riggs at the hospital. And he acts is acting kind of suspiciously. So they follow him to Mike's hospital room and they see him try to inject air bubbles into mike's uh i guess iv or whatever to yeah. cause an embolism and Yikes. kill him yeah they're just gonna murder him in his <laughs> hospital bed <laughs> probably the darkest moment we've seen so far i mean we've seen like accidents but never i'm about to murder you Mm -hmm. Or at least for people besides Nancy. Nancy almost right. gets murdered a bunch, but ne right. never like, I'm going to go murder this college kid because he didn't comply with my gambling rules. Mm -hmm. So, but Mike has been saved. They catch him. The police catch him yeah. and arrest Dr. Riggs. So we know he's the bad guy. He's been arrested. That's not, that's, uh, that's resolved. So that's, that's our mystery wrapped up. But at the very end of the book, Ned and Nancy are talking and, Ned is still upset with Nancy. Okay. I'm just I'm just going to read a few parts of this because I just think it's important. Got to do it justice. So, you know, Nancy is still confused because now that she knows, you know, the payments were to specific players who were helping with the, you know, quote unquote practical jokes, she asks Ned where he got the money for the bracelet and he says 
that where else it came out of the money I earned lifeguarding last summer. And she's like, well, why did you keep it a secret then? And then he says, Nancy, do you realize, realize how hard it is for me to give you anything? And she's like, what are you talking about, Ned? You give me gifts all the time, balloons, chocolates. And he says, I'm not talking about gifts. I'm talking about more important things. Love, support, sympathy, that stuff. Mm -hmm. Ned, are you nuts? She cried. You're the most loving, generous guy in the world. And he says, and you're the most independent girl in the world too, Nancy. You don't need me. There's nothing I give you that you can't get from a hundred other guys. And he says, it's true. Not only that, when you get right down to it, who comes first in our relationship? You, your career, your cases, even your suspects. Every time I help you with a case, you keep me in the background. My opinion means nothing to you. Well, let me tell you something. I'm sick of being put down and ignored, Nancy. I can't even give you a bracelet without hearing you ask how much money I spent on it. Mm. And she says, how could I have made you so angry? Or, you know, how are you so bitter? Have I really been that terrible to you or whatever? She's like, I don't understand why you're upset. I thought that we shared everything, you know, the danger and the fun. And he says, sure, but that's not what I want anymore. It's not enough. She says, what do you mean? He ran his fingers through his hair. Nancy, I've been thinking about it for the last few days. And well, I think it's time for us to start seeing other people. (gasps) Ned! Ah! Oh! I can't live with the way things are between us any longer. You're changing, Nancy. You don't trust people anymore, not even me. And Mm. I'm sorry, Nancy, my mind's made up. We can still be friends, I guess. Or at least we can try to be. Oh. Ned, no. Goodbye, Nancy. And good luck on your next case, whatever it is. And that's how the book ends. And she's standing there crying as he walks away. That is how the book ends. Oh. Has there ever been such a tragic end to a Nancy Drew book ever? No. I don't have words. Okay. <laughs> you want to get into it? You want to just immediately start talking about it? Because I have so much to say about this. Yes, let's get into First it. First of all, Ned's being an asshole. Ned is He's a massive terrible. asshole. <laughs> So, I mean, to start with their very first fight in the dormitory after she's found the evidence against Mike, right? The packing peanuts and Mm -hmm. she presents it to Ned. I think she's being entirely reasonable. She's not being mean. She might be being a little um, insensitive, you know, potentially to Mike and Ned's relationship. But it's not I I mean, it's 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 fair enough to say that he's a suspect at this point. Now, you know, maybe this could just be a situation where Ned is upset and that could be justifiable, right? He'd be upset Mm -hmm. that his friend is being accused. That's fair. But he takes it out on Nancy. You know what I mean? And he he basically tells her, you're like, you know, you should trust me about this, that I, you know, know that Mike is innocent. There's a, a certain point in the book where he says, like, you can't just know things with you know, logic and reason. Sometimes you have to know it with your heart. And I'm like, okay, sure, fine, but not in the case of like a crime being committed. You know what I mean? Like you have to have facts and evidence. Ned Ned thinks he has intuition about Mike being fine. And then Nancy's like, well, here's hard evidence that he did this thing. And he he did do it. We do find out that he is the one that made the dummy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she was right. She was right the whole time. And Ned was being a massive hothead throughout the book. And then he breaks up with her. He breaks up with her. She is like fighting it every second of the way out there being like, Ned, I love you. She even says, you know, Ned, no, Ned, don't do this. Yeah, Ned, I love you. Please don't leave me. And he's like, sorry, my mind's made up. I'm out of here. He's being a huge jerk. Being a massive jerk and it seems to be like for no reason unless there is something else going on here like maybe ned has feelings for mike Mm, maybe my theory (laughs) is that ned has a little bit of closeted feelings going on 
for Mike. And maybe that's why he's so, you know, upset about it. And that this is a convenient opportunity for him to break up with Nancy because he has feelings for somebody else. It adds up. Just saying. Just saying. I will say that I think some of the things he says aren't entirely unfair um, as far as Nancy when he says that um, my opinion means nothing. That's often and not, true. And not trusting him. I, I think, you know, I think you could consider that as to be maybe true. I think, I mean, as, as far as what we've seen, Nancy tends to only accept things that fit into her, you know, her worldview, right? So, mm-hmm. and also, like, they have to be, like, shown to her directly. She's very much, like, a visual person. And with, like, Ray Unger, this is what I was talking about before, she immediately accepts his word that he was, uh, he was just this. basically carrying on this, yeah, persona of being this really angry guy because he didn't want people to feel sorry for him. And she's like, okay, I guess that means you're not guilty. Even though, like, literally he held a gun to her head before. So... <laughs> It seems like, I mean, maybe Nancy's, you know, judgment about people's guilt or innocence, isn't that reliable? Right. And, you know, maybe she should be trusting Ned about who who is a good guy and who is not a good guy. Right. Now, though she was right about who was involved in the crime and who was not involved in the crime, I don't think that's what Ned was talking about. Right. Right. Ned was talking about Mike is a good guy and he wouldn't be deliberately malicious. Right. So, you know, is the act of sabotaging your own team malicious? Maybe a little bit. You know, there were other people in on this also. He wasn't, you know, trying to like hurt anyone physically. But, you know, losing a basketball game could potentially, you know, hurt someone's chances of a career or right. I don't know. It could have could have done anything. And he might have been kind of forced into it by the doctor. Right. He didn't want to do these things. But doctor's been going around, or not doctor, but he's been ordering people be, being beat up. It could have led to a lot of other issues had Mike not cooperated and gone ahead with the dummy. Yeah. So, so, I, so I mean, I think that, you know, Ned has some valid points. And that, yeah. you know, I guess yeah. it's fine if he wants to break up with Nancy or whatever. But the way he goes about it throughout this entire book is so infuriating um, and just so absolutely like it's like a class. It just feels like it's like a classic angry guy oh, yeah. scenario. You know what I mean? And poor Nancy throughout the whole time, she's trying to think like, what did I do? What did I do wrong? You know, how did I handle this poorly? What can I do better? You know, Ned, please, let's talk about this. Ned, I love you. You know, she's always trying to problem solve with him. And Ned just shuts her down time and time again and just gets angry um, and won't talk to her. So, you know what? Good riddance. I said it. Good riddance. Also, and this is, okay, this is might be a little bit nitpicky, but he gets on to Nancy for having her ask how much money he spent on the bracelet. But that is not what she did. She did not right. ask him how much he spent on it. She said, this must have cost a fortune. And That's he all she really said. really pissy with her about that. Like, that could have been, I mean, you could have even taken that as somewhat of a compliment, right? Like, oh, you spent so much money on me. You know what right. I mean? I mean, and it, oh, oh, sorry. I'm so pissed about it. Never oh. mind the fact that she's doing all of this as a favor to him and his yeah. team. She almost gets murdered over she- doing this favor for him. And then, like, directly after almost having been murdered, he's like, you do nothing for me, Nancy. You're not even, you don't <laughs> even trust me anymore. I'm breaking up with you. And she's like. Hello, I just got chloroformed with a gun held to my head and almost got tied up and thrown in the black back of a Camaro and murdered in a field somewhere. And you're dumping me because I wasn't attentive enough or yeah, yeah. didn't agree with you enough about Mike, who was actually guilty. But it feels like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when people criticize Buffy again and again for like taking charge and like making decisions for everybody or whatever. And it's like Buffy is literally trying to save the world and you're just her sidekick. Like you, I'm sorry, you have to sit down 
and listen <laughs> sometimes because, you know, she's responsible for more than you are. You know what I mean? So this feels like a, a very much a situation where Nancy is put in life and death situations and everybody else around her is just the normies. And she is the one who has to be like, you go there, do that. You go there, do that. Because, because, because it's serious. It because is, people's yeah. lives are at stake. Her life is at stake. Yeah. And stuff has to get done. You know, do you not want her help? Why are you acting this way? Right. Help her. Right. Yeah. yeah. He asked her there and then like what a day into it is like, I'm not helping you anymore. Deal with mm-hmm. it on your own, Nancy. It's like, well, this isn't her problem. This is y'all's problem that she's trying to help you with. Like, right. it doesn't matter to her if y'all don't make the playoffs. It changes her life in no way. Right. Do you want the help or not? Yeah. Cooperate then. And I mean, I mean, to think like, what if Nancy didn't show up? You know, what would have right. happened? I mean, potentially nothing. Potentially, you know, the, you know, the gambling would have gone on as it did. Everybody would have been perfectly fine. Just, you know, Dr. Riggs would be that much more richer. But potentially also Mike could have gotten a conscience for maybe talking to his girlfriend and mm. decided, you know, to go up against them again. And maybe Mike would be dead, right. you know? Without without Nancy's interference, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nancy Nancy saved your lover, Ned. <laughs> Gotta show some gratitude. This was a particularly hard one to read, having just finished The Clue in the Diary, because mm. we have such a, a nice start there, and it's all so cute and exciting and bubbly, and then this is just so frustrating. And <sighs> even the... Um, the contrast in how the two mysteries end mm. clue in the diary ends with, Oh, well, Nancy, can I take you on a second date sometime? And she's just like, Oh, well, maybe, maybe we'll have a mystery that we can work on together in the future. And then oh. here he's like, good luck on your next mystery, whatever it is. Oh, Ouch. Ouch. And, then, Ouch. and then not to spoil anything here, but we do have this little preview of the next mystery. Her next mystery is Ned has a new girlfriend and Nancy has to help him to like save her or figure out what's going on with her. Yeah. So that next mystery that he's all petty about is actually going to be her helping him again. Ned, Ned Nickerson. That's what we call an enmeshed relationship, everybody. (laughs) Yeah. Is Nancy in a toxic relationship with Ned? Is that what this is? I think that Ned has like classic nice guy syndrome. Mm-hmm. So it seems like, I mean, especially when you were talking about the comparison between Clue and the Diary and this, like, yeah, he was all helpful in Clue and the Diary, buying Nancy milkshakes, running errands for Nancy or whatever, because he wanted to get into her pants, kind of, mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote. And now that he knows Nancy isn't interested in that, basically, she's more interested in solving mysteries. He's like, nope, I'm out of here. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're not interested in fawning around around me, you know. Uh, taking taking my opinion above everybody else's. God forbid you have, you know, your own, like, sense of justice and rightness, Nancy. You got to have mine. So I'm out of here. Bye, Ned. See Bye, ya. Bye, Ned. See ya. Now, unfortunately, I do know they get together again. <sighs> well, we just finished um, case number 17, yeah. and they're all lovey-dovey. Like, oh, I miss you, Ned. I love you. And they're fine again. So how soon? I mean, obviously, we know it's not going to be the next book, probably. But how soon after case eight, between eight and 17, when did they get back together? How does it happen? Okay, I can I listen. This brings into question Nancy's entire, like, judgment, in my opinion. Right. Uh, how could you get back together with someone like this? How could you get back together after this? I guess, fine, she loves him, whatever. Maybe this was a bad week for him, I guess. But, like... It was a bad week for Nancy, too. Yeah! She almost got murdered. Maybe, I mean, maybe if he, like, seriously apologizes. You know? I hope so. I'm on Nancy's side for this whole argument. A hundred percent. hundred percent I'm with you. I'm sure he felt like he was doing the right thing standing up for Mike, but as soon as the evidence was presented against him, he should have at least heard Nancy out and been like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, let's talk about this a little bit further instead of just immediately launching into her. I mean, it's fine. It's fine if you want to be upset at the suggestion that your friend could be involved in something. That's normal. That's natural. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, you know, say, Nancy, I really don't want you to investigate my friend. That could be fair. But 
getting so angry with her and yelling at her the way that he does and like not talking to her and like cutting her off and stuff. That's just unacceptable. Hanging up on her. Yeah. Uh, like that's unacceptable behavior for a boyfriend. I'm sorry. Like you have to communicate. You have to talk to your girlfriend. I'm sorry. Right. Sorry. It doesn't matter how much that silver bracelet costs. If you're nope. going to be a dick to her. You're going to be a dick. Yep. Bye, Ned. Bye, Ned. Nancy, anyway. you can be single. You're much better off single, <laughs> focusing on your own career, your own cases. Get your goals, Nancy. <sighs> yeah. On another note, I thought, okay, th- we definitely got some interesting best fat shaming in this book. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, there's a really weird, gross moment where um, Nancy goes to talk to Ned and he makes a comment on like, where are Bess and George? And she's like, they're at the gym. And Ned's like, Bess is at the gym? And they like talk Keep about- Keep your mouth shut, Ned. It was gross. <laughs> it was, okay, I'm going to find it because I think it's worth noting- so she says, George went to the sports complex to work out. Bess is with her. And a smile tugged at the corner of Ned's mouth. Bess went to the gym voluntarily. Uh-huh. Nancy smiled, too. She said she didn't want to be alone in the room after the break-in last night. So amazing. This is Ned talking. Amazing. Maybe some good will come out of this case after all. And Nancy says, if you think Bess will discover the joys of working out tonight, forget it. She only went because she was desperate. So they have so much animosity between the two of them. And the only like moment of levity that they can find during this fight is making fun of Bess. Making fun of Bess. What awful people. (laughs) It's awful. I mean, but also like, I I mean, uh, okay. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot abide. I, I, I can't abide some light teasing between friends if it's a joke that they have established, right? Nancy and Bess, potentially. I still think it's kind of gross, but whatever. I cannot abide Nancy's boyfriend making comments about Bess's workout habits. Absolutely not. I can't. Especially not implying that it's a good thing. Like, it, uh, it would be a good thing for Bess to work out. Like, for Bess to discover the joys of working out oh it's so great that someone broke into the room and terrified best and ransacked all your stuff because it'll mean make her want to lose weight oh yeah terrible implication i had so much hopes for this book because we had changed best's descriptor a little bit at the beginning from Mm. plump i don't know if you notice this from plump to curvy oh no i did not notice that yeah, they instead of describing her as as plump, they say that she is curvy, curvy blue eyed is what they describe her as. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe we are, you know, going to trend into a scenario where we're not describing Bess as being overweight. She's mm-hmm. just the weight that she is. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but not the case. So <laughs> can we also talk about some of the weird like um, cartwheels that they have to do in this book to try to avoid mentions of college students drinking and having sex. Yes. Because (laughs) when they're at the Omega Chi Epsilon party. Obviously everyone's getting wasted. Obviously (laughs) people are drinking, but they have to make a special note to say that when Bess and Nancy go to the refreshment table, they're going to get a soda. Right. Refreshment table, as though it's not a really sticky <laughs> plastic folding table in the corner that someone has set a handle of vodka on, and then there's like an like an empty two liter of Coke sitting there, and that's it. Maybe some or cups. Just if you're a lucky. massive bucket full of jungle juice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sitting on the floor, not a yes. table on the floor. <laughs> there's some hot beer stacked in the corner. Take your pick. <laughs> <sighs> you feel unlucky. Which one's the winner tonight? <laughs> um, and also, um, so after she has, you know, that refreshment with Bess, whatever, she 
<laughs> we're supposed to get that Nancy just was like overcome with a song or whatever. And she forgot all about whatever she was talking about with Bess and goes on to like the dance floor and dances so much for hours. And she gets so flushed and happy that she gets so worn out that she has to go find the bathroom. Not that she is drinking and because she's drinking, she has to pee. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Do we think Nancy was dancing on tables at this party? Mm, doubtful, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, so also, whenever they go to um, their special dorm room where Nancy is a special, considered a special visitor to the dorm, <laughs> they talk about how the dorm was co-ed. And, okay. See. Oh, so, there's a lot of teasing of Bess for there is, guys. George chuckled, hear that, Bess? You should love it here because this is a co-ed dorm. That's what she's saying. Bess, you should love this because it's a co-ed dorm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so are we just supposed to hear from that that Bess is sex mad? Um, Apparently. So then they go to say, she says, will you please knock it off? How many times do I have to tell you I'm not here to hunt guys? And then she says, Anyway, who cares? It's strictly buddy buddy in co ed dorms, right, Ned? What does that mean? Like, you're not allowed to go into the opposite sex's room without, like, a friend no, with you? No, I think, I think she's trying to say that people in co ed dorms aren't getting busy. She's trying to say they're oh. just, they're all just friends, right, Ned? Oh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, I like as much as, you know, this is Nancy Drew Files are supposed to be Nancy in college. There is not an entirely accurate take, at least in this one, about what that college is. Although, right. all the college experiences. Is Nancy in college or? I don't think so. Okay. I think she's still this weird nebulous, not in school, not having a job thing. I think it's still the same setting. Maybe she's a year older or something in this. Mm. I think she is supposed to be older. I don't think they specifically reference her age in this one. Interesting. But I think she's still in the same life circumstances. And so is everyone else. Like Ned's still in college, but she's not. She's just doing her mysteries. Right. Interesting. Interesting. I Okay. So one thing I noticed is that George is just as much of a bitch in this one. Oh, yeah. She is in um, other ones. Bess has some very legitimate concerns in this one, right. and they're all brushed off by George. And the only really mm -hmm. other interaction we see with George is the argument between herself and Tom over whether or not jocks are smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not, like, a really great, um, like, argument on George's no. part. She's just kind of angry. But so right after their dorm gets vandalized, Bess is upset and she says you're sure we're not in any danger for the third time and you know nancy says i'm positive don't worry you know i know how practical jokers think which is a funny comment and then she says she says they make their victims suffer in other ways and Bess says oh thanks now i feel a lot better being sarcastic and george says take it easy will you george snapped why can't you stop worrying for once and Bess says, fine, I will. The next time someone wants to wreck our room, I'll let them in and give them a hand, okay? And she says, don't be yes, melodramatic. Bess. And she says, well, what do you want me to do? And George says, relax. Come and explore campus with us. Is George just calm and cool as a cucumber through this whole thing? Because Apparently. She has to be, if that's how she's treating Bess. Apparently she just doesn't care about anything that's happening unless someone is insulting her status as a jock. And then she has to get super upset about it. Oh, I, goodness. yeah, no, props to Bess, though, for standing up for herself for a little bit and being like, yeah, okay, yeah, fine. I won't be melodramatic. The next time somebody wants to come in and vandalize our room, I'll just let them. Anyway, so I find the Bess and George relationship to be very interesting because they're always mm -hmm. together. They're always hanging out. But George seems to be like incredibly mean to Bess all the time. And Bess just takes it. And is Bess just supposed to be a doormat? And that's just her character is that she just lets people walk over her? Or is there more depth to their relationship that we don't see? I don't know. There has to be more that we're not seeing. 
it just seems like why would you be friends with each other if right. I mean I guess they're cousins so they're more than friends they're family but it's like you don't have to hang out with your cousin if you don't want to right. you know I don't like Bess's character having to be the doormat I also don't like George being the jerk to everyone and yeah. bullying Bess over everything it feels very like well this is the trope and so this is what you know they have to do they have to conform to but yeah I want more for Bess and I want more for George too George could be better. Look, ladies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. George could be a lot mm-hmm. better. We don't even like celebrate her like athletically. We just mm-hmm. see a nope. jerk. We don't even see her like excelling Do at the cool. gym. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Which stinks because we have a lot of opportunity for that, especially in the Nancy Drew files, like where there is yeah. a lot more action. I think George would be able to play more of a central role in chasing the bad guy or, you know, disarming the bad guy but nancy instead is the one who gets the karate skills nancy you know and of course we want to see our protagonist in you know the situations but it right. seems like if if george is there then you know it would give her an opportunity too yeah unfortunately okay so we've talked about let's see we've talked about best fat shaming we've obviously talked about uh ned and nancy's relationship we've talked about george's meanness did we did we talk about the school shooting range? Is there anything else you want to let's, say about the shooting let's range? Get into gun issues. <laughs> I would like to see fewer firearms in mm. all Nancy Drew stories, whether it's yeah. a book or whatever. I'm sick of yeah. it. Uh, obviously, this is um, pre the time when when school shootings started to become you know more and more common. So mm-hmm. it's a little surprising to me to see that there's school sanctioned gun use yeah. on the campus. Yeah. But I guess, I guess it wasn't, or obviously I don't know. We were both born in the nineties. So I yeah. don't know what it would have been like back then. I'm a little surprised to see that. Um, but obviously given the fact that we grew up in a time where school shootings did become more and more common as we grew up, um, I never would have imagined that there'd be a gun range on a college campus, let alone guns even allowed on the college campus. Yeah. Except for maybe by use by a police officer or something, but right. it's no, just even, astounding to me. <laughs> even the cops on our college campus didn't carry guns. I think they carried maybe tasers, but they didn't carry guns. And they shouldn't. Right. So I was incredibly confused by this. And yeah, maybe like you said, it's just a, a signal of the 80s that we just didn't know about. But yeah, I mean, the idea that on any college campus, weapons wouldn't be absolutely prohibited is... Mm-hmm insane to me like I think about like the list that you get when you move into the dorms or whatever it's like (laughs) you can't have a hot plate you can't have a lighter you know like you can't have Mm -hmm. um you know candles or a knife or you know like you can't or nunchucks whatever it is they say on those lists (laughs) to think that there could be such a thing as a a school sanctioned firing range is just bananas to me Especially on a college campus where there shouldn't be any guns. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't the policy in 87. Yeah. It yeah, would yeah. be by by the time we got to college. That's mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I also wrote a note that was just like, Nancy has to apologize for being right. Which I just... I don't, this might be like a a personal thing, like personal struggle that I have, but I have a lot of issues about, you know, being right um, and and wrong, right and wrong. And so because Nancy, I'm sorry to circle back this whole argument thing, but that's basically what the whole book is about. But it is the idea that Nancy has to cater to Ned's feelings for for hurting Ned's feelings when she was right, like when she was right to believe what she believed and she was right to say what she said and she didn't say anything mean or unkind. She just stated facts and stated her opinion. And then later has to be like, Ned, I'm so sorry that I hurt your feelings with this Mm. is like, so angering to me right (laughs) because it feels it feels rooted in sexism oh it is you know the idea that like even you know when a woman is right and justified 
we still have to be protecting men's feelings. Oh yeah, because their feelings in this is, are what's are most more important. important than the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So I wanted so badly to see Ned side and things, and mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I can understand wanting to stick up for your friend when you feel like that's right. Yeah. But everything else beyond that was just ridiculous. I tried so hard <laughs> to like see his point of view, and I just couldn't. I just kept getting more and more mad. Like, why are you doing this to Nancy? Please don't act this way toward her. She's trying. She's trying so hard for you. Mm-hmm. I f- and I wonder too, like if we were women in the eighties, would we read it differently? Would we feel that Ned is more justified? Would we think, okay, maybe it's right that Nancy is apologizing? She did hurt Ned's feelings, right? Like, is this just because we've come a little bit farther, you know, right. down the road that we're able to say, like, no, like Nancy is allowed to you say the truth you know like like say it you know like speak it but uh, you know I don't know I I just found myself yeah just completely just so angry just so angry for Nancy and angry that Nancy wasn't angrier at the situation I wanted Nancy to stop apologizing and stand up for herself which she does at like at one point but then afterwards she apologizes again and it's like "Mm, mm -mm, mm mm-mm mm-mm don't apologize for being right, Nancy. Nope. Especially when it when you are like going about doing all this to save lives. Like yeah. you're trying to help people here, and yeah. And Ned is in the wrong. He's wrong. He's yeah. in the wrong. He's wrong. He sh- he, and he never apologizes to Nancy. He never mm-hmm. once says, "Look, I'm sorry for yelling," or "Yeah, I was really upset. I shouldn't have said this like that. Um, I do feel that way, but like I, you know, I was a jerk." He never says that. He Mm -hmm. continues down this road of like, you know, you know, I can't believe that you would suspect him. I wish you should have trusted me. Um, You never consider me or whatever. Instead of being like when Nancy what's at the end of the mystery, when you realize that, yes, Mike had something to do with all these practical jokes. You should feel some remorse about giving your girlfriend such a hard time about Mm -hmm. thinking that he did. You should be like, okay, well, you were right, I guess, about that, at least. But he doesn't do that. He absolutely it's doesn't do It's more like that. Mike will never play basketball again. So you should feel bad that he's even in this situation yeah. in the first place. It's so your you should fault. feel sorry for him. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When like, you know, how many people would have not gotten assaulted had Mike been doing the right thing in the first place? Mm-hmm. You know, having ricked all these basketball games, how many people did he actually hurt in the process of that? Right. I mean, oh, he yeah. wasn't doing it himself, but like. People were getting hurt because of Mike's actions, at least in some part. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the assaults, really. But, like, yeah, the fact that Nancy comes to this school or whatever, and she ends up stopping people who have been, like, assaulting students on campus. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, she if she hadn't have done that, that would have continued. Right. You know, like, she's saving people from being victimized like that. And Ned's like, I can't believe you. Ugh. And these assaults are not like, no. oh, someone got punched. This is like Nancy Serious. has physically she has a hard time looking at these people mm-hmm. because they are so like mangled from uh-huh. the beatings that they received that their faces were so bloody. She barely even recognized Captain Hook. Yeah, that's why I think that's oh. why they put so much emphasis on her thinking that he's attractive so that later when she sees Mm -hmm. him all beaten and bloody, she feels sick because she sees his face and she can't like none of what, what she saw before was there. So like, so unsettling. Yes. (laughs) So anyway, (laughs) so back to the argument, I do think (laughs) that the dynamic between Nancy and Ned Definitely more progressive than what we see in the 30s or the 60s. It's true. true. But yeah, maybe maybe we have progressed in our feminism a little bit too far that we see this from a different light as what it was written in or than what it was written in. Yeah. Nancy is at least able to stand up and say, like, I really think that this guy did it and I think you're wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So she's able to challenge him in that regard, where probably we wouldn't have seen something like that in the Nancy Drew mystery stories. Not because Nancy wouldn't have her own ideas about who did it, but because she probably wouldn't say them out loud until she was in a position where she could prove it. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. So I think, yeah. So that's 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 the market difference here. And it seems like that's Ned's biggest issue. Right. 
-hmm. is that she, you know, she's speaking up and saying something and he's not into it. So, well, he wants her to clue him in on the mysteries. And then when she does, (laughs) he doesn't handle it well. Yeah. Oh, so what do you want her to do, Ned? What do you want from Nancy? He doesn't want anything from Nancy. He wants Mike. You know what? (laughs) I hope they're happy together. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Any other comments? I think that's all I got. So regular Drews, you know, we really encourage you to read this one because it's just, it just seems like such a landmark book for, for Mm -hmm. Nancy. One, because it ends so sadly. And two, yeah, because of like all of the contention between Ned and Nancy. So like, don't just take us at our word for it. You should read it if you can find it. Yeah. I would get a copy of this one. So do do you want to give it a flashlight score? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, no. (laughs) What would you give it? I would give it, oh, Probably a three. I'd give it a three out of five flash. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking three as well. Yeah. I had a, I really enjoyed reading it. I think it was a really good read. As mu- as angry as I was at Ned and Nancy, I live for the drama. So I really yeah. appreciated <laughs> like feeling that anger on behalf of Nancy. Um, but overall, I feel like some of the drama, it was just like a little unrealistic. Plus, mm-hmm. yeah, all the, the violence was really a lot. It was really intense in this one. And there was just a lot of it. Yeah. And so, yeah, for that, I I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed, uh, like, Stay Tuned for Danger that we read. Oh, yeah. I would also give it a three just because it did make me so uncomfortable reading it with all mm-hmm. the drama and the violence. I don't want that to reflect on the writing itself because it was a very well-written book. I don't mean to say that it was like a bad book or anything, just the content of it was a bit much. So yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, read it. (laughs) You should read all the Nancy. You should. should. Okay. This leads us to our next one. Mm -hmm, Case number 66, tall, dark and deadly. Ooh. Yeah, I just love this cover. I I just think it is the coolest. I mean, one, it's almost exactly our logo cover, our yes. colors, the blue mm-hmm. and the br- bright pink. Um, I just love pink. I just love pink so much. Me too. Um, so I'm really excited. So yeah, join us uh, next time for Tall, Dark, and Deadly. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you liked this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at regularnancydrew and Twitter at regularnd. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $1 level receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks for listening. Hey, regular Drews, make sure you check our Instagram tomorrow for our puzzle for August. We are going to be posting a little sneak peek, a puzzle with a clue to episode 14. So we hope that you will check that out, give it a whirl, solve it, and let us know when you have. Yeah, good luck.